Hello, Michael. Hi, Catherine Zuzi. What kind of name is that? Uh, hey, Michael. It's um, apparently it's Hungarian. It means uh, sweetness. Good. We need that. On, so we could end the interview now. <laughs> we need that on, in government. And before I asked the question, I said, wrote to you, why do, would you want to be on the city council? Uh, because I think we have many challenges before us and i have a track record of bringing people together coming up with common goals and moving forward in accomplishing those goals and i think this is a time in the city's history where we've got major challenges relating to housing relating to transportation, relating to climate change. Um, and we really need to come together as a city to solve those challenge, those problems and to move forward. Wouldn't we, we, can't just if, be, we can't just be for or against something. We actually have to problem solve and come up with solutions that work. Shouldn't we send you to Israel instead? <laughs> uh, one step at a time, Michael. Oh, okay. All right. So the question I sent you, which is a hard one, um, I'm not sure I could answer it about any work I do, but what makes you unique? Because a lot of good people, as I'm sure you know them, mm -hmm. are running for the City Council of Cambridge. An election is the first Tuesday in November, so what would make you, you could be just one of the good people, but is there something special about you that we really need? I think what distinguishes, I agree there's some excellent candidates, but I think what distinguishes me and the reason that you should give me your number one vote is because I do have this track record for getting things done. Uh, I'm known for being collaborative, for listening. Okay, for one at a time. Okay, yeah. this will take the show, or maybe getting things done. Give us one example. Okay, so for 12 years, I've been leading uh, the revitalization of Magazine Beach Park, which is our- oh, I love it. I yeah. love it. Thank Do you, you love that park? Make the river swimmable, can you? <laughs> Uh, well, it's not swimmable yet, but um, if all goes as planned next year, there will be a new dock in the water. So you'll be able to dangle your feet into the water. Wow. And will there'll be another you... outlook. Will um, we lose our feet? No, you won't lose your feet. No, oh. no you won't lose your feet. So the, the worry with the river is that um, I'd love for people to swim in the river, but we're not there yet. Um, because the thought is, you know, there were some factories in Waltham and there were all these um, slaughterhouses, ab abattoirs across the river in Alston Brighton. And the thought is that there are heavy metals and PCBs in the sediment. We don't know for sure, but it seems likely that there's some bad things in the sediment. So we can't swim in the river until we encapsulate parts of the river bottom. We need to Actually, at Magazine Beach, I, I don't know if you know this, but it, it, the river is only about eight feet deep at center at Magazine Beach. It's rather shallow. The, the, the river is actually more of an estuary than a river. And so we would need to dig and then we'd need to encapsulate. And then our other challenge is when there is a big storm event, when there is a, yeah, severe weather, um lots of water goes into our sewage system and that water is a lot of that is actually in this the water the storm water is is processed at cot cottage at the cot cottage farm facility at magazine beach so they like remove all the leaves and sticks and rags and trash from the water at cottage farm at magazine beach and then they bleach the water. They have like five Olympic-sized swimming pools underground. They 
they ble they bleach the water and then they unbleach the water and then they send it on to Deer Isle for more processing. Or if there's so much water, they um, send some of the water into the river itself. But any, anyway, so most of the time the river is pretty clean. So you could swim in the water uh, if there hasn't been a big storm. Wow. Yeah. So that's good news, right? Is that soon? What? Is that soon, maybe? Well, you know, just you just can't swim in the river when there's been a big storm event. So if, if there's a big storm event, then all the sewer water but will we be in can the river. Otherwise, now, well, you're not supposed to, Michael. Uh, you don't do it yet. Uh, oh, I and, love and, and it. You would need to wear water shoes because again, it's the sediment. We're worried about the sediment. Got it. Yeah, but one it day I like hope. You know what you're I love your passion. I love your caution. <laughs> love it. Okay, now that made you, that was response to you can get things done. Well, it's part of a response, but also just from my work at Magazine Beach. So that's been a complicated project because it's involved. So first I needed to organize the community or it's sort of the, the community made it clear to me that they wanted the park back 12 years ago because the, pla the place was in terrible condition and then we needed to we we wanted to engage dcr the department of conservation and recreation it's a state agency they own the park they own all of the charles river parklands but they are an agency with very little funding and very little staff so the only way we could get their attention was to engage cambridge so I've been working with city staff um, in all different departments for 12 years, um, and they have been working with us. So the communities raised money, then the city donated money, which inspired the state to contribute money to make improvements at the park. So, so far, $8 million of improvements have happened wow. there. Yeah, and another two million, two million plus is about to happen um pro next year. Um, we're waiting for that project to go out to now, bid. When you say we, is this a job of yours or are you a volunteer? I am a volunteer and I have an amazing board. I'm part of Magazine Beach Partners. I'm the president of Magazine Beach Partners. So we have been at it since uh 2017, but you need to realize that we've really been at it since our first community cleanup in 2010, when as a member of the Cambridgeport Neighborhood Association, we did a cleanup, we raised money to fix the roof, to do a study. You know, we've gotten a lot of Community Preservation Act, Act funds for the project. And most recently, we got ARPA funds, which were really great. And then the, the city has recognized the importance of this park because it's for um for over 50 years it's been like the favorite picnicking spot for a lot of families that live in affordable housing that don't have access to open space so they gather at the park as well as many many other people and it is their place to gather with family gather with friends commune with nature enjoy the sunset it's a it's a very important site. And what uh, moved you to do this? Ex oh, what inspired me was because I I started out as like when my I have a son who's almost twenty six now, and when he was little, I was trying to teach him about civic engagement, and I can't say that that lesson took, but um, it did it did engage me at the park. So we did, we did some photography at the park and we sent and of the BU bridge, which was in terrible shape. And we sent letters to the mayor and to the governor and to all sorts of very important people. And um, as I used to say, it was like Harlem before Harlem was, uh, was improved. I, I couldn't believe that here in this rich city, rich state, rich country, we'd have such a destitute park. So 12 years ago, you know, the, the oldest building on the Charles River Reservation, the powder magazine there, it, the roof was filled with holes. There were all these squirrels living in it. 
There are all these trees growing into the foundation of the building. There was graffiti all over the building. I remember. Yeah, everything was broken. The picnic tables were broken. The benches were broken. The playing playground was broken. The waiting pool was broken. That was like the theme, brokenness. So over time, we fixed it up and it's pretty spectacular. Yes, thank you. I live walking distance. And what moved you? You've answered us another question of you help you help people work together. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? I'd love to know. <laughs> um, I think because I listen to them. I, I'm always listening to stakeholders. I respect um people's point of views and the differing points of views and then the challenge is to come to a common view right and then to move forward in achieving those goals so i'm big on implementation after you come up with common goals and i am rather um dogged and i have a lot of energy and um i'm 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 sort of I have a broad vision, but I also pay attention to details. So I and I don't give up. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm positive. I'm positive. I try to make it fun, and I and I acknowledge people for their contributions because. Wow. And yeah. so you want to leave this job to go to city council, <laughs> or is it an, an addition? Uh, well, we have one step at a time. I. We'll have to if 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 I'm elected, and I really hope I am elected, um, then we'll find another member of our board who will lead at the park because my attention will really be divided. And uh, the only way a park is a living tapestry, and the and and there are always people, uh, public lands, whether. Public lands are always under assault because people think, oh, I could build a building there. Oh, I could. People have a lot of ideas for public land. Actually, historically, schools, libraries have all been built on open spaces. So someone needs to continue to defend this 17 acre, you know, centrally located piece of public land. I will tell you where we have some fabulous partners and that's also um, part of the secret of our success is that we partner with people. Um, so right now our major partners are Mass Audubon who have an urban nature center in the historic powder magazine and they've been doing fabulous work. Um, and you know, for, for eight to 10 years, I, we were planning programs for the park every summer we planned over a hundred programs to bring visibility to the park dancing but, um, drumming yeah dancing african dancing i we, love we dancing tried, there yes yeah um bachata who would have known bachata dance has become like the thing at the park what is that uh, uh it is latin dance with a lot of rhythm and There'll be another, I think, bachata dance in October. Go to magazinebeach.org events and you'll see when it is. But like 80 to 100 people come out for bachata dance. And uh, it's uh, people are dancing on the patio. It's a beautiful thing to see. I, I think that music and dance and food are extraordinary at bringing the community together. Yeah. Love it. So what are some tips for all of us you, you mentioned listening and bring anything else to bring people together well i think you have to trust to delegate um and and again my my board has been fabulous in guiding the strategy for the park uh but without you have to have the courage to partner like another big partner is the charles river conservancy they're fabulous another fabulous group and fabulous partners so they've been overseeing i used to organize we used to organize most of the cleanups now the conservancy organizes most of them 
we've partnered with the Charles River Watershed Association, the Riverside Boat Club, the Arts wow. Council, the Department of Human Services, the library. I, I mean, I feel like if you work collaboratively and you celebrate everybody's contributions, then they want to be part of it. And then you can accomplish so much more than you could by yourself. I think we will send you to the Middle East. I'm sorry, but <laughs> so and what are some of your hopes, plans if you get on to the city council? I am a lover of neighborhoods and I feel like our neighborhoods are one of the things that really make Cambridge so special. Um, I was the head of our neighborhood association for four years and I've been on the Cambridge Port Neighborhood Association for like more than 10 years. It's embarrassing how many years I've been involved <laughs> with that organization. I'm currently the treasurer, but I really believe that we have to know each other in in our neighborhoods. And um, I I also think we need to neighborhood, we need to have neighborhood associations for each neighborhood. We have 13 very distinctive neighborhoods. That's one of the fascinating things being a candidate, Michael, is that you are canvassing all over the city. So you go places you've never gone. You go down streets you've never been on. You see things you didn't know existed and you meet wonderful people everywhere. And the other thing is you hear their, their problems. You hear, um, you hear their concerns. And then your, your job as a city council candidate and ultimately as a city councilor is to sort of, you know, synthesize, you're like you're sort of channeling all this energy from all over the city and and then listening to people and then thinking about, well, what should my priorities be? And uh, what are the major problems that we must respond to? But I was going to say, I, I, I really, as a city councilor, I would celebrate our neighborhoods and our neighborhood scale. And I would listen to neighborhoods because neighbors use their neighborhoods and they really have a lot of good ideas about what works and doesn't work. Don't you think? Um, so what are some of the problems people have? Oh, my gosh. The major problems have to do with our lack of transportation planning. So um, I am a cyclist, and my husband cycles to work most days, um, and we need safe bike lanes. There's no question we need safe bike lanes. But the rollout of the bike lanes uh, has been problematic. In in many cases, sometimes they're great. As a cyclist, they're great. But if you talk to pedestrians, if you talk to drivers, if you also even talk to cyclists, they they will tell you people don't know which way to look. People uh, feel unsafe. They feel unsafe as pedestrians and as drivers. At first, when I was walking Cambridge, I thought it was just older older people were talking to me about their discomfort in driving. But then my husband, who's who's in his early 60s and an excellent driver, um, started talking to me about how unsafe he felt driving at night. So that the challenge is you've got sometimes the bike lanes change all the times. Sometimes they're one way. Sometimes they're two ways. Sometimes there are electric bikes on them. Sometimes there are scooters on them. Sometimes there are cyclists wearing black. You can't even see them. They don't have lights. Um, sometimes uh, all of these vehicles are going the wrong way on streets. Um, and then with the bike lanes, the, sep the separated bike lanes are often, um, you know, they're next to the curb and then the parking has been put more in the middle of the street. So cars that are turning right like can't see the cyclists and live in fear of hitting a cyclist or being hit by a cyclist. Yeah, it's very, it's it's scary. So there are certainly kinks in the bike lanes that we need to work out. And the whole idea of the bike lanes were that they were gonna be a pilot. They were quick build. So the whole idea was that the city was rolling them out and then the city was gonna listen to feedback and then the city was going to make refinements to the lanes. So those two things 
feedback is coming in and it needs to be analyzed and then improvements need to be made. Like retailers uh, have lost a lot of their parking, their loading zones, um, uh, handicapped people, people that are in wheelchairs have some um, accessibility issues now with the bike lanes. There are issues with the bike lanes and the bus lanes. So it's a hard problem, but Michael, we can figure it out in Cambridge. I'm, I know we can. Love it. I love it. Any other problems that people mentioned? <laughs> um, other problems are congestion, lots of congestion. Um, and the MBTA, <clears throat> as, I, as you're familiar, hasn't been working well. What, is that, what does that actually mean? Oh, so the buses have been bunching and aren't reliable. You mean they come all come they come at the same time? Yeah, they all come at the same wow, time. And then, yeah, and then the red line and the green line have had great delays. So I was talking to some people near Porter Square, and they said to get to work in the hospital district, it took them an hour to get to work on public transportation. So now they were driving, which adds to the congestion. So since uh, public transportation, the, the subway and the bus is not reliable, more people are driving and that adds to the congestion. But we've got to come up, if, if the MBTA, if we can't, if it's not going to work for a while, we need to come up with a plan B. Like maybe we'll ask Harvard, maybe we'll partner with Harvard with their little Harvard buses. You know, they have these electric buses that go up and down Mass Ave. Yeah. Maybe they can be available to Cambridge residents or maybe we should have our own little Cambridge Jitney service. You know, there there must be other ways. What does Jitney mean? Uh, oh, Jitney, someone was just telling me that in Mexico City, there are these um, like these vans that go up and down main drags and you pay $2. And you can get on and get off wherever you need to go. Um, I mean, it sounds a little scary to me with all the cyclists, actually. But the idea of coming up with an alternative system wow. to our buses, um, if, 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 we, if the buses and the subway isn't going to work, we, people have to be able to get around, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly for me, too. So they're talking about that. Uh, also, people are saying they don't feel like anybody's listening. Um, they say they feel like uh, there's a lack of transparency. Um, I, I, I feel as if the city actually works very hard to be transparent. They have this open meeting portal. You can like sit in from the comfort of your home to most city meetings now. Um, you can read the notes, um, but people want more transparency. They want want to see more data. I know we received an award from Bloomberg for having such great, having so so much great data and using our data to manage the city. But for whatever reasons, many residents feel like nobody's paying attention, and. That's a problem. People are worried about um, flooding. People are worried about. Um, Me too. Yes. Are you worried about flooding? Um, yes, we got flood insurance in our condo association. Oh my goodness! Wow, that must have been expensive. Yes. Yeah, they're worried about infrastructure. Many people feel. I know the city's spending a lot of money upgrading infrastructure, but they feel as if. We need to spend more money. Well, they're not really talking in terms of money, but they're thinking that we need, um, as the city is, the city is growing. The city is rap is growing. There's no question, and it will continue. Are you growing to in grow. number or? It's growing in number, not in size. We're st still like six square miles, but we yeah. are growing. Um, like at the Volpe site, that will add like twenty thousand people, residents, and commuters to the city. At the Our Volpe. Uh, oh, uh, oh, in East Cambridge, where MIT is developing, um, I think it's a 14-acre site where the Volpe Transportation Center is. Oh. Um, yeah, there is a lot of development happening in East Cambridge. There's a lot of development happening in, it's called the Alewife Quad near Fresh Pond, where Iggy's is, 
in the gymnastics academy in DPW. Um, that's an area that's uh, experiencing tremendous growth. So we need to make sure we have the infrastructure, um, the electricity, we've got to have the utilities, we've got to have playgrounds, libraries, schools, all of the amenities all these people need. We need to be planning for the future. And, you know, with growth, you, you have to have infrastructure. So we've got to be thinking in terms of that all the time. Well, well, I don't know you well, but I'm voting number one for you. <laughs> uh, we have three more minutes. Is, how would you like to end your appeal for people's number one vote? Oh, my. I should have practiced this, Michael. I'm so glad you have it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but before then, then, I'll give you a chance to think that over. How much work is it being on the city council? Is it a full-time job? I would make it a, it would be a full-time job for me, especially as a newcomer. Um, I, I'm already, I mean, it's fascinating being a candidate for city council because I'm, I've been learning about affordable housing. I've been learning about homelessness. I've been learning about um, bicycle lanes. I've been learning about Buido and, uh, tr you know, transportation solutions. And when you learn about homelessness, I, I, I say that because I volunteered as a homeless shelter near here. Oh, good. For people who, uh, who drink. And it was, it's so sad that it, with all these beautiful buildings, they're crunched in a little place, sleeping with many people. Is this at the Albany Street Shelter? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's in, for decades, we've had about 500 homeless in Cambridge. No matter what we do, um, and what services we provide, and even if we transition people to housing, you know, uh, you know, full-time housing, we have had a steady population of about 500 homeless people. And I, I think part of the challenge is that we are, um, we are so kind in Cambridge. We, and we're rich, we're rich and we're kind. It's a nice combination. It and we really- seem kind to me to have it seems they could have built a big high rise for the homeless, why right? instead of a little hut? Right. Well, I think we try to do the right thing. And as a city councilor, that's what I'll be working to do is to try to do the right thing. Um yeah, I, I was just talking to um, oh my goodness, uh Jim Stewart, who works at Eleven Garden Street, and he was just a fawn of information. But it sounds to me like we have about 240 or 250 beds. And then we have these um, single room occupancy rooms at the men's Y and the women's Y. Wow. Yeah. But but clearly, you know, through the history of time, you know, we've always had poor people in communities. So that's one of the big challenges. That's what I'll be working night and day to uh to try to problem solve about michael is, is oh go out. kathy Zuzi. <laughs> yeah we gotta we've got to figure out how how we can how we can be helpful to people how we can transition them out of hope homelessness oh i love it um, so it's um time to say goodbye to our wonderful viewers what should you what would you like to tell them Check out my website, votezusi.org. 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 I am um, Kathy Zusi, Zusi for City Council. Please give me your number one vote. And I thank you, Michael. I thank you, viewers. Um, and I look forward to serving you. Oh, my. I look forward to being served. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much.